Welcome back to Questing Beast. Today we're taking a look at a very interesting article written by Luca Reyes, who's the author of Ultraviolet Grasslands, one of my favorite D&D adventures slash settings, where he asks a question that really helped reshape the way I thought about D&D. And that question is, is D&D a game or is it games, plural? The article itself was written on his Wizard Thief Fighter blog, his old one, not his new one. I'll put a link down below and was written originally in 2016. There is a bit of a preamble at the beginning, but skipping down to the meat of his argument, he says, when you get together with friends to play chess or Monopoly, you know exactly what game you will be playing and what the victory conditions are, but not with D&D. Now, this is something that's been known for a long time. Gary Gygax talks about it himself, that D&D is kind of an infinite game that goes on forever. But Luca is really not making that point here. He's saying that the reason why you don't know what you'll be playing exactly is because D&D is a kind of collection of games rather than a single one. He lists five different games, at least, that you're playing when you're playing D&D. Number one, an overland exploration slash travel game that is literally outdoor survival from Avalon, the so-called hex crawling. When he's referring to outdoor survival, he means that there is a literal game called outdoor survival that is a game where you just travel from hex to hex and try and gather resources and not die. This game came before D&D, but Gary simply grabbed it and kind of imported it directly into original D&D, where he recommended that you use that outdoor map as the overworld for your D&D games. If you're playing a campaign of D&D and you're using the hex crawling rules to travel from one place to another over large distances, then the session is going to feel a lot different than a standard session of D&D. It's going to take on a much more zoomed out, strategic, kind of board gamey feel to it, because indeed it is kind of based on a board game and the more hex crawly war games that came even before outdoor survival. You're going to be thinking about things like weather. You'll be thinking about mountains and rivers and can we travel through this forest? Do we want to go around it? How dangerous is this zone versus this zone? The kind of decisions that you're making are pretty distinct to this mini game, I guess, then you would be thinking about if you're doing dungeon crawling or you know city crawling or just playing a role playing session where you're talking with other characters. Now, the second game of the games of D&D is a combat game that originally comes from Chainmail, which was a miniature war game. Back in original D&D, the combat system was much more kind of this add on where he recommends that you go buy a different game, Chainmail, to run the combat. Now, you didn't actually have to buy Chainmail. There is a system of combat in original D&D, but you get the sense much more clearly that there is it's a separate mini game, right? People still feel that today when you're playing 5e and you roll initiative, the whole tone of the game changes and you shift into doing a different thing than you were doing before. The third of the games is an exploration slash mapping game where players delve into a dungeon. Uh, this is where the grid squares come from. It was much easier to get grid paper to draw architectural labyrinths. This is one of those mini games that's kind of been lost to modern D&D. There used to be much more rules around how you actually proceeded through a dungeon crawl, and it was much more board gamified or mechanized in a way that's a bit hand waved now. Luca is right to call it a mapping game fundamentally. You see this in original D&D. The goal of exploring these dungeons is for you to describe a labyrinth. It's often described, I think, even using the word labyrinth or maze in OD&D. And you're describing how far you're traveling, what the different directions are. Can you go left or right? What the shape of the rooms are? And the players are trying to keep up by drawing these shapes on a gridded paper. They're trying to actually replicate the maze that you have in your mind on their paper so they can figure out how to get out again once they have gotten enough treasure. In some ways, it's kind of a drawing mini game because you can see how early dungeons were designed in such a way to make them difficult to describe and to make them confusing enough that it would be hard for players to exactly replicate where the corridors were, where the rooms were on their particular map to get them a little bit lost. The fourth game in D&D is a hero simulation game where the PCs go from zero or level one to hero over the course of several sessions. This is where the whole experience thing comes from. I think we see this mostly today in the form of uh, builds. You see this all over YouTube, right? How to build the optimal ranger, how to combine this race with this class to make the perfect character and then plotting out their ascension over the next 20 levels. This is an entire game within D&D that a lot of people play without ever actually rolling dice or playing the real game. Finally, we have a game of improv which is the DM's funny voices in the actual role playing, which are surprisingly completely untethered from rules in D&D. Now, the big question, of course, is whether all of this is a good thing or a bad thing. In modern RPG design, most people will say that this is a bad thing. 
that what you want is a RPG system that is coherent and all the parts interlock with each other and every part is informing all of the other parts. But there are some real advantages to a highly modular mini game system like the one that old school D&D at least tends to be. Not the least of which is you can add your own mini games pretty easily. You can just snap them on and it's probably not going to disrupt things too much. Before we look at some of those though, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. The Tomb of Geisengax is a mega adventure authored by Luke Gygax and Alphineus Gu, created to celebrate the legacy of Gary Gygax in a story-driven campaign. The box set will include a campaign setting and an adventure book, a massive lore book, a game master reference book, and many full-color art handouts, color maps, NPC portraits, magic item cards, and much, much more. The campaign is filled with lampoony Easter eggs and humorous nods to TTRPG lore, a game that's as fun to discover as it is to play. Check it out on Kickstarter using the link down below. All right, let's look at some of the common mini games that are added onto D&D. You might have a domain game of geopolitics, which might as well be replaced with diplomacy or similar simple strategy games. This is not uncommon in games like Worlds Without Number or Stars Without Number, which have a mini game that the game master plays in between sessions that figures out what all of the factions are doing. And in original D&D, there was a sense where your character would get up to a high level and they would become a kind of NPC, often a lord or a high ranking cleric or a master wizard out in the world the players can interact with later on. And these high ranking NPCs could start playing a kind of domain game. Other things he mentions are a world building or a history building game. You might use Microscope to do that. That's an RPG that builds a world's history. You have in-game gambling and fortune telling. You have a dungeon or a city building game that you could use Lego bricks and dice to work on. He says, this big playhouse means that there are different things for different people to enjoy. And I actually think reducing D&D to just one or two of any of these components diminishes it. Honestly, it's not a great exploration game. It's not even that great of a combat game, but the mix and the openness of games it allows, this is amazing. By the same token, taking the subsystems of the game and trying to reduce them to the same rule system does not necessarily work well. I think what it comes down to is that D&D was not ever really intended, at least originally, to be a kind of unified system. It's because the focus of the game was this novel thing where you were exploring a fictional world. That was the juice of D&D. The focus is on the world and making choices in the world and seeing what happens. And those choices can be at all sorts of different scales, all the way from tinkering with a trap inside a dungeon to commanding your army to move to the kingdom next door and attack it. If the players want to start building a castle and they want to design what the fortifications look like and they want to, you to estimate for them how expensive is that going to be, that should be a thing that's possible too. And all of these infinite possibilities of simulating an entire world are not going to lend themselves to a single unified system. Now, that's my take on the subject, but Lucas' take is actually slightly different. He says, what I do think is a problem is that D&D is presented in the game books isn't upfront about this situation, that there's multiple games in D&D. It clearly refers to D&D as a game, but then says that the game has no real end. No, of course it doesn't have a real game. Why? Because the campaign is just a themed playtime. Now, to expand on what Luca means by playtime, we can skip ahead to an article he wrote a few years later on his later blog, also called Wizard Thief Fighter, linked down below. Of course, he has a caveat that these are just his own thoughts and not some authority from on high, but he says that there is a reason why the cover page of Ultraviolet Grasslands contains the line psychedelic metal role-playing rather than role-playing games. He says it's because calling the accoutrements of our uh, delightful hobby games sows the seeds of profound error. It conflates the time we spend uh, together with friends playing with the games we play and the toys we play with. What you're doing is less playing a game and more a leisure activity where you're hanging out with your friends and you are imaginatively exploring a world through whatever means seem fun to you tonight. He says, we have games with words where we crack jokes, games with roles where we put on funny voices and pretend to be other creatures. We have drawing games when we make pictures of our heroes and detail the maps of imaginary places. We have games of chance where we roll dice to see what happens, where we pull cards from decks of many things. We have games of tactics where we throw our protagonists into battle against morks and drolls. We have games of strategy. We have games of storytelling. We have games of writing. We have games of dress up where we carefully choose our arms, our armor, spikes, and pulls. And we have games of games where we invent new rules and change the way that we use our games. So what of all the role-playing games, all the rule books, the game books, most miss the mark because they jumbled together toys and games as though they were one single game when they are not. Most of them can be unbundled and remixed to taste. And the thing with friends playing together is that they will inevitably, inevitably begin playing their own way, fitting games and toys and activities to preference and circumstance. 
I think Luca is a really great example of the OSR ethos of disliking being told what to do with the rules of a game. The designer of a particular game may have a vision of how it is supposed to be played, but that person has no authority over your particular table. Your table, what your players enjoy, is primary, not the book. And once you realize that, in Luca's view, as a designer, you can start to create role-playing game books that actually help that along and fit with that. You can create books of subsystems and mini games that players can pick and choose from and cobble together to create what works for them. This vision of what a role-playing game is, is something that has been very much resisted, especially by the big corporations that make these games. Because when you have a attitude where games can just be taken apart and pulled back together, then the primacy of the rules and the importance of buying more rule books becomes less and less. You can see this resistance going back all the way to the early days of D&D. Like this is from issue 26 of the Dragon Magazine. I'm quoting here from Grognardia, which is a great old school blog. Here, Gary Gygax says, because D&D allowed such freedom, because the work itself said so, because the initial batch of DMs were so imaginative and creative, because the rules were incomplete, vague, and often ambiguous, D&D has turned into a non-game. Very interesting choice of words there. Gary's not a fan at this point of the fact that D&D is now heavily controlled by its own players. He wants to systematize it and tighten it up so that it is all one thing for all people. He says, that is, there is so much variation between the way the game is played from region to region, state to state, area to area, and even from group to group within a metropolitan district. There is no continuity and little agreement as to just what the game is and how best to play it. Without destroying the imagination and individual creativity which go into a campaign, AD&D, which is he was uh, working on at the time, uh, rectifies the shortcomings of D&D. There are a few gray areas in AD&D and there will be no question in the minds of participants as to what the game is and is all about. There is form and structure to AD&D, and any variation of these integral portions of the game will obviously make it something else. So what is your take on all of this? Would you agree with Luca that what you're doing is more of a playtime with friends, where you are choosing different rules, different subsystems, different toys to incorporate into your campaign to play the game that you want to play? Or would you focus more on seeing the D&D or role-playing games in general as a structured set of rules that everyone should get on board with so they're playing something much more consistent and focused? Is D&D being a kind of hodgepodge of several different games a good thing for it overall, or do you think it hinders it? Please leave all of your civil and thoughtful comments down below. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.